All right, AP literature teachers. So given that we are in the heart of test prep season, I thought I'd crank out another writing workshop video for you where I'll showcase how my templates can be used yet again to construct uh, an FRQ. And in this case, we'll take a look at the 2020 exam, FRQ number two, Catherine Ann Porter's The Fig Tree. And, uh, you know, I love I love love saying this. I mean, this is this is the 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 cool thing about using templates. It totally demystifies the writing process for students. So I hope at the end of this video, you say to yourselves, "Man, Christian taught me nothing new today." You know, like he said the same old, same old, same old, and I'm like, "Yes, that's the glory." So, you know, come time of the exam, students should instinctually kind of habitually know how to tackle uh, their essays. And given that, you know, at least my students are using my templates, they really don't need to think about how to construct, you know, it's more of a, a matter of like ascertaining the meaning of a, of, a, of a text and shredding it on paper and capturing their thinking on paper. So um, hopefully, you know, that happens for uh, you and your students as well. So nothing new in this one. I'm going to stick to the status quo and um, talk about the declarative and the inverted thesis with regards to the introductory paragraph paragraph and uh, body paragraphs as always will go syllogistically so let's dive right in first order of business though as always I say this to teachers all the time you got to Bob Ross your instructions so especially when you're um, using templates it's very important, I think, for teachers to position themselves as the expert writer in the classroom and paint with your students. So give them a couple of introductions that you wrote. Show them a couple of times how to do the body paragraph, uh, manipulating the template. And you'll find that uh, you do this enough, it really demystifies the writing process. And uh, students will take off and just absolutely grow and mature as writers and become pretty adept at, uh, at writing. You know, it's like, I always tell my students this, if we were to say, you know, we're not doing AP literature anymore, we're going to do Bob Ross and just watch the joy of painting. If we were to watch, you know, episode after episode after episode of the joy of painting with Bob Ross, I think we'd all really grow and mature as painters with time, even if we had an absolute ineptitude uh, with regards to art and painting, we'd get better, you know, and the same, same goes for our kids. And, you know, Bob Ross only used one template. He called it a heuristic, the wet on wet technique. And we're giving our kids a couple of, uh, templates to, um, you know, proceed through their expository writing. So it's pretty cool. So here's the prompt. The following excerpt is from Catherine Ann Porter's short story, The Fig Tree, published in 1960. In this passage, Miranda, a young child, observes an interaction between her grandmother and great aunt. Read the passage carefully, then in a well-written essay, analyze how Porter uses literary elements and techniques to convey Miranda's complex reaction as she observes the two older women. So I gave this to my students blind. Uh, I'm really not uh, um, helping them parcel through text anymore because they can't take me to the exam, although they wish they could. So um, I thought this was a fair, a fair exam. Um, it's complex. Um, there's some intricacies to it, but definitely fair game. Uh, I had no complaints about this one in 2020. So the immediate question is this, how can I, how do I construct the introductory paragraph? And as always, you have two choices. You can declare or you can invert. And um, for my students, um, I always tell them when you're writing literary analysis, I think it's best to invert the thesis because the prompt is really asking you two questions, two implicit questions. What is the authorial intent? And how does the author construct meaning? To truly get a, a good, girthy, juicy, complex thesis statement, you kind of got to answer both of those questions. And the same is true for rhetorical analysis for our kids that are doing the laying exam. If our students answer these two questions, they are pretty much guaranteeing themselves that they're going to have a complex thesis that sets them up to perform literary analysis. Oftentimes, 
you know, I'll get through looking at an introductory paragraph and say, uh-oh, I don't think this kid met the demand of the assignment because uh, it sounds like they're setting themselves up to do a like cliff note synopsis or a plot summary and not a literary analysis. So I really like it when my students tackle these questions, um, get to the answer of them uh, in their uh, introductions. So let's talk specifically about what that's going to look like. So for literary analysis, I have my guys invert. And here's what I mean by that. The very first three sentences, they're going to answer the question, how does the, or, or, or what, what is the authorial intent? So what is the authorial intent? Last sentence, they're going to answer the question, how does the author construct meaning? And that's going to be the thesis. So in declarative, you begin with the thesis and then you parcel it out with context and background. And all of my introductions for all of my templates, no matter the expository mode, each introductory paragraph is going to be four sentences long, no more, no less, exactly four sentences. So in this case, all right, the student is going to start with, um, you know, what is the authorial intent? A very heavy focus on the theme. So like, you know, why, why did Porter write this? What's the gist? What was her point? What was her message? You know, what's her exigence in doing this? And uh, as always, you know, for those of you that are familiar with my work, you hear me talk about sentence complexity. Um, you'll see my students, uh, at least they'll attempt to have some voice rhythm and flow in the manner in which they manipulate their, their syntactical features. Uh, oftentimes students, uh, you know, like young, emerging, struggling students only manipulate a couple sentence structures when they write. And my guys have been schooled in uh, the art of strunk and white. So we have a textbook that we use called Write It Right. I got a couple of YouTube videos about this. And they make the assertion that there's 12 different ways to construct a single sentence. So you're going to see that um, my guys can push the envelope a little bit with, uh, with complexity. You're also going to see that my students have um, some pretty decent vocab. We do a word study academy all year long. I really do a lot to get them to augment their vocabs over the course of the academic year. So you'll see um, a good reliance on what I call tier, tier two level vocabulary, which is just basically your average run of the mill SAT level word. And uh, that's it. So four sentences. What is the authorial intent? How does the author construct meaning? Is going to be the thesis statement. That's going to be the fourth sentence. Focus on those sentence constructs for voice rhythm flow. And then uh, let's get some tier two in there without sounding, you know, pedantic, pretentious, like a goon. And got to keep it in the wheelhouse. So let's see how my students did this here. So very first move out of the gate. What is the authorial intent? There is forever a hollow place in our hearts once we realize that those we look up to as children are fallible and flawed individuals. And that's kind of like the big epiphany, like, bah, exactly. That's, that's the whole point of the story. So drop it. That's the authorial intent. In a metaphoric sense, it's like coming to the realization that darkness rings the campfire. With the loss of innocence, which will invariably be set a child, there comes the heavy weight of life's penalty for merely being human. Last sentence, get into the terms and the devices, the construction of meaning. How does Porter do this thematically? Porter arrives at this truth through quipping dialogue and the evolving characterization of Miranda's realization that those adults she holds so dear to her heart are inherently broken toys. So always four sentences. The last sentence is going to be the, the thesis because we're inverting and you got to drop your terms and devices. So you see the student talk about characterization, dialogue uh, in there. So context, background, authorial intent, sentence constructs, vocab. That's the whole template. So here's student number two going, going to approach it the exact same way. 
No one knows the value of innocence but for the one who has just lost it. But the price of wisdom is the loss of innocence. As wisdom is gained, innocence is proportionally in the balance of loss. For Miranda, it's in the advent of her critical nature and her honest questioning that she comes to see her grandmother and great aunt in their true light of being. Now look at the last sentence here, construction of meaning. How does the author construct meaning? Porter expresses this phenomenon of what is lost and what is gained through the sister's bickering diction, precise characterization, and syntactical manipulation. Every single time, the student can do this for uh, FRQ1 or FRQ2. So I got a lot in the in my YouTube channel um, uh, to demonstrate how they can always, always, always invert and answer those two implicit questions. Focus on the sentence constructs, focus on the vocab, and boom, you got some magic happening here. One more, and this one is just very basic. Innocence is an unconscious state of being. For the first few years of life, children are not equipped with critical eyes to see the fallibility of their beloved elders. But with age comes wisdom, and with wisdom comes the loss of innocence. Very simple sentence here for the thesis. This idea is clearly conveyed in the excerpt through Porter's manipulation of dialogue, syntax, and imagery. I just drop the thesis construction of meaning in the last sentence so and again that's the that's the glory of that inverted template for uh literary analysis it can be used every single time so the guessing work is out of the picture come exam time you know so it's just student and the text if the student can ascertain a deep conceptual understanding of the text they should crush their um their writing um on many many levels so let's revisit the syllogistic method as we transition into the uh, uh, body paragraphs. And for quick review, uh, I'm not going to get into all the jargon and the imbued discussions about what a syllogism is and the history of it. You can go back and look at some of my other videos. I'm going to assume that most of you are familiar with my work at this stage of the game, but just a quick synopsis. The syllogism is rooted in the Aristotelian tradition. So Aristotle ran a school called the Lyceum and the rich aristocratic boys would go there to learn about polemics, debate, oration, and as we see in classic texts like uh, Plato's Republic, you know, somebody would throw a big girthy question like, what is justice? And the philosophical think tankers would gather around the mic and they would drop their definition of what justice is. And Aristotle observed that, um, kind of like us as composition instructors, that um, some of his students had better lines of reasoning than others and that they would win their debates and uh, create more cogent, more well-developed, thoughtful, logical arguments. And to help his students um, with their line of reasoning, he uh, created a heuristic called the syllogistic method. And you're looking at it here. Basically, it's when we argue from premise, premise to conclusion. Within all of the moves that a student can make in the body paragraph, I want them to go syllogistically to sustain that line of reasoning. So in a first premise, I might say all men are mortal. Second premise, Socrates is a man. Conclusion, Socrates is mortal. That's cogent reasoning. That's very logical. It's very lockstep, very mathematic. You know, if I were to say arsenic is deadly. My dog ate arsenic. My dog is going to die, right? We would nod our head and say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, unfortunate, you know, for your dog. But uh, yes, that makes absolute sense. And oftentimes when our students write, uh, especially for the purposes of the uh, lit and lang exam, they pretty much only present to us the second premise and that's why they appear to be so plot heavy it's pivotal that all three steps be there um, to fulfill the demands of the assignment which is to perform literary analysis so on paper for this porter piece here the fig tree this is what the template's going to look like 
So the first premise is going to be a statement that contains, you know, uh, literary terms and or devices. And we want to multitask, right? Otherwise, uh, we're going to have one paragraph tone, one paragraph diction, one paragraph syntax. And we can't do that. We're going to run out of time and it's too methodic and, you know, banal to, to write that way. So we're not going to we're not going to do that. I'll show you how to you know, multitask the first premise and uh, get it to be a bit more complex. The second premise, I like to see a teeter-totter balance of quoting and paraphrasing. So just textual support. You don't want to do one more at the expense of the other. You got to keep that in kilter. And then the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph, and I really want to emphasize this. So the, the conclusion of the body paragraph, not the conclusion of the essay, is the textual analysis. So the first premise, in other words, is like a promise. I promise you, dear reader, that in this paragraph, I'm going to talk about, you know, uh, the syntax and the tone uh, in conjunction with um, the extended metaphor, as an example. Right? To keep the line of reasoning, you can only talk about those three things. So in the end, the conclusion of the syllogistic body paragraph you kind of got to go back and shake hands with that and echo the thesis so students often ask me this question how many sentences should a body paragraph be and i think that's a great question because all too often in looking at uh, sample papers those little itty bitty five six sentence body paragraphs um they don't do enough there's there's not enough there's not enough support and analysis in there to achieve um, um, a fully substantiated argument so i tell my students to shoot for 10 sentences no 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 more than 12 like hard cap at 12 sentences so you're shooting for 10. so the first three sentences set up the focus of the argument and that's the first premise and you have to get anchored in literary uh concepts so use the terms and devices so as a ap lang teacher as well i know on the synthesis uh portion frq1 the college board says your argument must be central and i say that to my students all the time if we're you know doing expository writing which we are you know the argument needs to be central and we're doing literary analysis which is an act of arguing so i want my students to take the first three sentences to keep that argument locked in and central. So a first premise is always going to be three sentences. Look how my student did it here. So a couple of things. Students often ask, where do I begin? My, my first body paragraph. And I say, start right where the author starts. Have a chronology, have a sequence, right? Because that ties in with your line of reasoning. Your organizational structure uh, is deeply aligned with um, the line of reasoning. So this student transitions with right from the onset, right? So go chronologically, go sequentially. So up top in Porter's piece, what is she doing you know on a literary level to construct meaning what is her intent what are the terms and devices being employed so look at how these first three sentences kind of get to the heart of that just look at this right from the onset we are made aware of the fact that miranda is self-aware enough to know that when she bickers and badgers her sister she's in the wrong and in knowing this, she feels shame for her behavior and the initial pangs of her loss of innocence. But what pushes her over the ledge of innocence into wisdom is the chronic nagging that occurs between her grandmother and great aunt. All right. So I always tell my students this, and I do this during writing workshops with them all the time in like one on one writing conferences. If we are to express your first premise as a promise, what can we anticipate to be analyzed in this body paragraph? And in this, the way it's articulated, we're expecting certain things to happen, right? So all of the quotes and all of the paraphrases should be germane to this umbrella concept that we have in the first premise. So let's see what we have here, all right? So we got a starting, fourth sentence starts the second premise. You gotta go get into the text. 
The dialogue from the start immediately brings forth a loss of Miranda's innocence, the knowing that these sisters are just a few short years away from death. The grandmother, while the great aunt is teetering on a wobbly ladder, reminds the sister that there's such a thing as appropriate behavior at Eliza's time of life. This seems like an innocuous and caring plea, but it plants the seed in Miranda's young mind that this phrase of her life, that this phase of her life is impermanent. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things that are going on here. So I like this one, two, three punch of quote paraphrase analysis, right? So oftentimes students quote willy nilly. It seems very arbitrary. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, this, this student's talking about the dialogue, which is germane to what's being discussed in that first premise. And this quote seems to fit into that notion of innocence and the loss of uh, the loss of innocence, the transition into adulthood. Seems like a perfect quote, right? So one of the things that I want my students to do is to is to quote with deliberation, but also to be very conversational when they quote. So I have something called the five word rule. If a student places a minimum of five words in front of the quote and keeps the quote small, it should sound conversational as it is in this case and then you'll see you know like sometimes students need to bracket and uh you'll see that uh here so you got to keep going quote keep going this seems like an innocuous and caring plea but it plants the seed in miranda's young mind that this phase of her life is impermanent porter even characterizes the grandmother as tartly while suggesting further that Eliza looms like a mountain with her grizzled iron colored hair like a curly wig, right? So all the quotes, all the paraphrasing underneath the umbrella concept or the promise of the first premise. That's how you keep the line of reasoning intact. Miranda's loved ones are old. And as she comes to the wisdom of old means death is right around the corner. But it is in the arguing of the sisters that the young child comes to get a stark realization of life. Constantly quipping at each other, Eliza reminds her sister that so long as grandmother can go bouncing off on that horse of hers, she can therefore climb ladders. All right, and again, perfect quotes, like great quotes. So we're talking about that adulthood innocence characterization the dialogue if we bring in anything extraneous we're going to break our line of reasoning and break our promise so everything needs to be aligned with that promise and we're doing good work so far porter's characterization of the grandmother's response yet again cast a shadow on miranda's innocence her grandmother turned pink as the inside of a seashell the one on her sewing table that had the sound of the sea in it. Children listening for the sea through a shell is pure innocence, something Miranda unquestionably did. So let's talk about there. You see, you got the quote. Oftentimes students will quote and they run away from the quote. They just abandon it. I call it quote dumping. Analyze it, but stay connected. Keep the line of reasoning all connected. But in seeing her grandmother's reaction, Miranda felt sad and strange and a little frightened. And I like what the student did here. Just a couple of words. You don't have to take big gargantuan quotes. Just wordplay, diction analysis. The shadow further covers her innocence and brings her into wisdom when she sees her great aunt with snuff-colored eyes and snuff-colored woolen skirts shove snuff into her nose. This is what women of the lower classes do. All right, so we got plenty of support here, right? We're getting getting long. So let's wrap this up. Shake hands back with that first premise and echo the thesis, right? Wrap it up. Usually the conclusion of a syllogistic body paragraph just takes a couple of sentences. So listen to the echoes here. Innocence is fragile. What ultimately breaks Miranda's spirit is when she comes to realize that she is a bother and constantly underfoot. Ironically, the behavior of the sisters is what isolates Miranda and leaves her aching and confused. But what ultimately ends her innocence is that she comes to know that love is conditional. Right, right back to the thesis. So, did we stay aligned? Did we keep our line of reasoning? Did we deviate from the promise in that first premise? 
are all the quotes linked, all the paraphrases germane, all the analysis tied together. Yep, nothing extraneous comes in, so we have some pretty decent writing. And it goes back to all the nuanced stuff that we were talking about in the space of writing introductions. Tier two level vocabulary, sentence constructs, voice, rhythm, flow, you know, all that good stuff comes into comes into play. It needs to be executed. So try your hand at Bob Rossing uh, your instruction. Paint with your students and uh, you know, see if you can manipulate the template for them and give them a couple of concrete examples uh, or models on, on how to um, proceed through this FRQ. And to wrap things up, I uh, got a couple of irons in the fire here. So uh, as you know from you know Facebook postings and my comings and goings, um, looks like uh, going forward, I'm slated for the last Tuesday of every month with Perfection Learning to do a free webinar. And I've uh, been doing a little bit of everything. So we talked about... Um, you know, my question, what if we taught composition like Bob Ross teaches painting? I did one on my alternative grading methods. So every month we got something new coming up there. So stay stay abreast in the uh, Facebook groups and you can see what's happening there. Um, dabbling with the National Writing Project a little bit. And then as uh, some of you have heard, uh, Tim Freitas, Brandon Abden, and myself are presenting at the National Council of Teachers English uh, Conference in the fall uh, in Anaheim. And uh, Tim and I are collaborating on a textbook together. So uh, one of the things I'm doing to kind of get my templates out there, uh, as well as my alternative grading methods and my Plato Plato discussion is I'm doing a course called the Teach It Right Five Week Mastermind. And essentially, in a nutshell, what I'm doing is equipping teachers with um, the whole kit and caboodle of what I do um, as a composition instructor over a five week period. And uh, yeah, we just revamp, retool, reimagine how uh, composition and uh, all of its ancillary parts get um, um, displayed in the English classroom. So at present, we're, um, we, well, I, I'm, I'm finishing one up uh, currently. It met Thursday nights at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we got to decide upon whether or not we're going to go Tuesday, Thursday, or Sunday. So that's still to be determined. But um, if you would like to uh, work together and, um, you know, kind of learn my, you know, my tricks, my madness, my, my, my ways, then uh, reach out. So my email is teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. I also have a web page, teachinghowtowrite.com, that has some information on all of these uh, things. And um, if you want the PowerPoint that you're looking at uh, so that you can facilitate your own uh, writing workshop, then by all means, please reach out. So take care for now. Be well. Happy teaching. Happy writing.